Brett here. Needle electrodes. Can you bend these yourself? If I can bend this or six subdermal needles or this elevator, well I really don't want to bend it so I'm going to bend this stainless steel that's the same size. I might even be able to bend parts of this retractor but I'm not gonna because I just love this sucker. So the question isn't whether you can bend these needle electrodes, the question is, should you? The second most important consideration is the sum of the legal ramifications. But overwhelmingly, the first most important thing to think about is patient safety. Why? When a needle breaks in tissue, it migrates towards the tip, which is pointing where? Usually exactly where you don't want it to go. But let's first get the legal ramifications out of the way. Remember, I'm not an attorney, so take this with a grain of salt. If a problem with the needle you bent ever results in a lawsuit, the attorney for the device manufacturer will try to prove the device was used in an inappropriate way by the clinicians involved. That might be you. The attorney for the clinician or hospital will try to prove the medical device was defective and the clinicians used it appropriately best to avoid that nightmare scenario. Here are the intended use statements on file with the FDA for three common subdermal needle electrodes. None of them state it is appropriate for the end user to bend the needle. My opinion is that a trial attorney will say that when you bend one of these, if the instructions for use do not say you can bend it, you're taking it into an off-label use territory. You have taken that liability onto your shoulders. So, if you're currently bending needle electrodes or other medical devices for that matter, maybe you want to talk to the manufacturer of those devices and make sure that they're okay with that. Hey, enough with the legal discussion, right? Let's get to the fun stuff. What happens when you bend stainless steel and can you break it? You already knew the answer. Of course you can if you bend it the right way. So what are the physics of how we broke this 316 stainless steel wire? So let's consider this wonderful stuff we call stainless steel. Coated steels, zinc or chrome plated tool steel, mm, I'm thankful for it. But stainless steel, it just looks right and it feels right. Stainless steel, it's amazing at resisting corrosion. Can we corrode it? Yeah. These are sisters, but it took hours of applied electrical currents and very strong acids, hydrochloric acid, to corrode this. And research has shown that we would have to use extreme pulse widths to cause our needles to corrode. A fun topic for another day. Stainless steel, extremely strong and full of superstructural characteristics. My favorite mechanical engineering professor, Steve McNeil, helped with the equations that show this swing assembly will safely swing a 900 pounder. Thanks, stainless steel. It's strong enough to be an exoskeleton for the gateway arch and an exoskeleton for the United States Air Force Memorial. That tallest spire is 270 feet or 82 meters tall. Stainless steel, very inexpensive. Stainless steel, quite biocompatible. This video demonstration is not the place to get into the wonderful electrical characteristics of stainless steel. However, just ask doctors Miriam Donahue and Blair Clancy about oxide layers on titanium pedicle screws as opposed to the more consistent, even-keeled electrical characteristics of stainless steel. Better save that discussion for another day. Enough about how wonderful stainless steel is. Is there a chink in the armor regarding breaking? Yes. Stainless steel, like many other metals, may become brittle when it goes through the processes that yield spring steel, stiffened steel, and the, and the stainless that is used in making medical devices like needle electrodes is indeed spring steel. 
We very much don't want a long needle buckling or bending as we drive it into tissue. So we better make sure that the steel in that needle is spring steel, very stiff. Just remember, when we make the wire slightly stiffer, it will not buckle as easily. However, it will be slightly more brittle, which means it can break easier. We already saw that I can easily break this wire if I use a set of pliers like this. I'm going to take a sister to the wire that I broke before, place it in the, this set of jaws with a large rounded set of grips. And I can bend this for hours. without breaking it. Why? Let's have a closer look. First, at an oval running track. Let's zoom in and place a starting line and a finish line. The inside runner runs this path. The next runner down runs a slightly longer path. Not by too much, but this outer line is obviously a little bit longer, right? And each runner down the line has a longer route to the finish line something wrong here a very unfair race in real life the track has different starting points so that the runners have a fair chance running the exact same distance to reach the finish line the curve or bend obviously creates sequentially longer distances towards the outside the situation is the same with a stainless steel wire wrapped around a bending mandrel rotating slightly we see the wire cross section at the widest part of the wire we can highlight a center plane in black around which the wire tends to deform. Zooming in on this smaller section, we see the inside portion of the wire is under compression forces that try to squish it slightly, while the outside portion is under tension forces that try to stretch it. And clearly, that level of compression, squishing, increases toward the inside, while the level of tension, stretching, increases towards the outside. Even though stainless steel is quite strong, if you stretch it enough, it will fracture and break. This is a stress fracture, and yep, that is exactly what we very much want to avoid. So, what variables are involved in bending wire in such a way as to avoid creating stress fractures? It will help to have a look at bending a wire, in this case, a 0.45 millimeter diameter wire, around mandrels of different sizes, each having a different bending radius, which is just an indicator of how small or tight the bend will be. What are the bending radii that we see here? Let's remove the wires for a moment. The largest bending radius shown is one millimeter. The medium is 0.5 millimeter, and the smallest is 0.1 millimeter, exactly 10 times smaller than the largest bending radius. This bending radius information helps us understand what we see when we put the bent wires back on. Let's consider the largest bending mandrel. For demonstration purposes, we'll create an outer to inner ratio. In this case, the ratio is 1.45. That means that the outer length, the outermost stretched part, is 1.45 times longer than the innermost compressed length of the wire. The medium ratio is larger. The outermost stretch length is 1.9 times longer than the innermost compressed length. And the smallest ratio is much larger. The outermost stretch length is 3.25 times longer than the innermost compressed length. So what's our take home message? The smaller the bending radius we use, the greater the tension forces we place on the outermost portion of the wire and the more we increase the risk for stress fractures. Or you can easily demonstrate this with the skin on the back of your wrist. Extend your wrist and grab a thick section of skin. When you flex, your skin becomes very tight. It might even be hard to hold on to the skin. But when you extend, it's very loose and you can easily grab it. Tight, loose. Or just play around with the slinky. 
and watch how clearly the outermost length is clearly longer than the inside length. Getting back to our needle bending question. Here is an image showing different size bends in four subdermal needles. The tightest bend, this one here, was bent using a small pair of pliers like these. And when we look at the outermost portion of that tightest bend, we can see evidence of small stress fractures. It's not easy to get these stress cracks. It took many tries bending with the tightest bend to yield this visible stress crack. So even though it's difficult to create the situation that yielded the stress fracture, we still need to work really hard to avoid it, right? How do we do that? First, consider these surgical clamps and this set of pliers that we might use to perform a bend. Let's get a close-up of their edges. The edges are quite sharp. It would be a big mistake to use these to perform a bend in a stainless wire as the bending radius would be tiny and facilitate stress fractures. It's not appropriate for me to recommend practice, so please remember the following is food for thought. It is not a recommendation. The same pair of pliers with the sharp edges. If you place plastic tubing, such as this PTFE or Teflon tubing, over the tips, it's just hard plastic, you have created a malleable, larger mandrel. Does it work? Well, it works pretty well for me. But is this right for you? Only you can decide that together with your biomedical team, your clinical team, your risk management team for your situation. And if you do decide to go with something like this, you just have to make sure you're using sterile technique. It's my hope neither to promote nor detract from creating bends and products, unless they're not intended to be bent, in which case you should not bend them yourself. Rather, I hope to explain how the stress fractures can occur so you can avoid them in the event you tackle the job yourself. Thanks so much for watching. I do hope this helped connect some dots. Um, that is my intent. And if, if this was helpful, if you got something from it, please consider subscribing. Regardless, I thank you for your time. And uh, let's keep uh, checking out our field and connecting dots.